Well, what's up, online campus? Happy Sunday to you and happy best hour of your week. My name is Matt Scobell, and I serve as the online campus pastor. If you're called Emmanuel Church home, welcome back. If you're brand new watching with us, I just want to give you a welcome, a shout out to you. Uh, say hello in the chat. I know our Impact team members would love to say hey to you. Do us a favor, though, if you are brand new, text the word hello to 65248. Love to send you a t-shirt in the mail. Just thanking you for being a part of our service. And then also, I'd love to just answer any questions you may have about Emmanuel Church and the online campus. But thank you again for joining us. I got two really quick things, and then we're going to worship together. Here's the first. This year, first time ever, we piloted something called the International Student Leadership Program. It's a 10-month program with seven of our students across several of our campuses, and they are learning leadership skills, uh, team unity skills, uh, fundraising. They are doing some incredible things this June, and they are going down to Cartagena, Colombia. If you heard of Cartagena, Colombia, we have an outreach partner called Exodo Church down there, and they are tasked, speaking of fundraising, they're tasked with raising $2,000 so that they can go down there and minister to the people of Cartagena, Colombia. Well, part of that $2,000, 500 of those dollars is actually gonna go directly to Exodo Church. So here's what I need from you. If the spirit moves you, there's a QR code on the screen. We'd love for you to be a part of the missions trip. Scan the QR code, make a donation. A lot, again, 25% of that money of their trip is actually gonna go down to Exodo Church. Can't wait to see what God does through those students. Be in prayer for them as well. Again, that's happening this June. And I got one more quick thing, really fast, all right? So you guys heard a couple weeks ago we launched our eighth campus. It was Greenwood East. Well, Greenwood East also sounds a lot like the Greenwood campus. So here's the deal. We got a Greenwood campus, which is our broadcast campus, which is what we're about to fly into and worship together. And then we have Greenwood East. Well, a lot of people are like, well, that's kind of confusing because there's two campuses with Greenwood. So here's the deal. Starting today, you ready? The Greenwood campus is now called the Stones Crossing Campus, all right? Stones Crossing Campus. Greenwood East is now called Greenwood East. They're the same, all right? So Stones Crossing Campus, Greenwood East. Last week, Pastor Danny was like, hey, I need you to create new neural pathways in your mind. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to create new neural pathways in your mind. It's now the Stones Crossing Campus, which is our broadcast campus, which we're going in right now to go worship. So if you're at our e-microsite, need you to stand your feet. If you're watching at home, you can stand your feet as well. I am so pumped that you are here worshiping with us. It's going to be an awesome hour. Thank you again for being here. And welcome to Emmanuel Church. Give you praise, because you're worthy, Lord. Well, I search the world. Come on, church. But it couldn't fill me. But it couldn't fill me. Oh, man's empty praise, treasures and flames. Never enough. Oh, then you came along hey. and put me back together. It's our testimony, and every desire is now satisfied right here in your love.
God is God. We stand firm on the solid rock that is Jesus, yeah. We say, Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking. Oh, I've never been more glad Cause I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I would even now
song Let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, here's my song Cause you are good You're good, yes Oh, you are good Yes, you're good when the rain comes, the wind blows. You are good. You are good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails.
My Jesus set me free of what he's done. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. Can we give God praise for what he's done for all of us? Thank you for worshiping them with us online. And thank you for joining us at one of our e-microsites as well. Well, as we move into our time of celebration, this week we wanna celebrate the people who make probably the biggest impact. And I use that word impact on purpose. And we're talking about our impact team. Let me read you a passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 and 12. Paul is, is trying to help the church of Ephesus and get it all started and going. And he gives this wisdom to them and I think it still pertains and I know it still pertains to us in 2024. He says this, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. So think of pastors, evangelists, teachers, pastors, that's staff, okay? But then listen what he says in verse 12. He says, their responsibility, so my responsibility as a staff, as a pastor, Pastor Dandy's responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. See, my responsibility is to equip you to do the ministry, to reach more people, because you know and I know the secret sauce here at Emmanuel Church is not the staff. 
it's actually our impact team members. We have almost 2,500 impact team members that serve week in and week out. Did you know that 287 people this year has stepped into serving for the very first time? How awesome is that? Did you know that it takes 600 impact team members, 600 impact team members to pull off just one weekend service? We have 80 something staff members. It takes 600 just to pull off one weekend service. So we just wanna say thank you, impact team. We celebrate you. You are awesome. There's a bunch of you online watching right now. Thank you so much for serving. But maybe you're sitting there at eMicrosoft or at home and you're like, I want to be a part of serving here at Emmanuel Church. Let me give you two resources. Last week, we talked about the Come and Grow series. In session number five, Pastor Danny does a five-minute video of why we serve. Check that out, eclife.org slash Come and Grow series, or you can go to our app and check that out. Kind of gives you the why behind we serve. And the other thing is, is just in a couple of weeks, actually one week, April 28th, we're doing our Impact Team Lunch, which is at, it, the online campus is gonna be at our Greenwood campus, but every single campus, maybe you live near a campus, they're doing an Impact Team Lunch. It's the best spot to get plugged in to serve. So find your spot to serve, Impact Team Lunch. If you want more information about Impact Team uh, Lunch, just text TEAM to 65248. All right, thank you so much. Every ministry that we get to do here at Emmanuel Church, it happens because you're giving every single weeks. So we want to say thank you so much for that. Maybe you're sitting there like, I want to be a part of what God's doing here. The two easiest options can be done right there on your phone. Go to our website, eclife.org slash give. Up in the right-hand corner, you'll see a button that says give or give online right in the middle of the page. Or you can just text the word give 65248. Uh, click the link. It's a secure giving page sent to your phone and you're on your way investing in the kingdom of God. And maybe you want to start small. We started something this past year called the $10 giving challenge. It's just that. It's $10 a week set up as a recurring gift option. That little bit of money, man, it makes a huge difference for the kingdom. So text challenge 65248 to take the challenge. All right, we're going to hop into week two of Habits to Grow Your Faith with Pastor Danny Anderson. You're an awesome message. The message is on prayer. Speaking of prayer, let's pray together, all right? God, thank you for who you are. Uh, thank you for our impact team. They, they, they do this just to love and serve you and build your kingdom. God bless their sacrifice week in and week out. God, uh, speak through Pastor Danny. Give him the words to say. Uh, open up our hearts and minds when it comes to prayer. I think all of us see and think about prayer in a certain way. God, just align our hearts with the words that you have given Pastor Danny. We love you, Jesus, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. Good morning, Emmanuel Church. How you feeling this morning? Besides a little chilly, had to get the jackets back out. Anybody depressed uh, today? Um, hopefully this message will uh, lift your spirit today. Hey, super quick, want to welcome all of our campuses and locations, eight campuses, nine microsites right now. Isn't that amazing what God is doing? He is just absolutely working tremendously. All across the state of Indiana, outside of the state of Indiana, we have a we have a microsite that met last week for the first time in Columbus, and they had 42 people at their first gathering. Can, can we give it up for Columbus right now? So exciting! Once a microsite hits 75 people, it it flips to a campus. So that may be looking like our 2025 campus. Who knows? It could be our second 2024 campus if it can, keeps growing. Uh, so very very exciting. Uh, if you're watching online right now, we want to welcome you as well. Last week, we started a series called Habits to Grow Your Faith. I love talking about habits because habits really make up our life. Like habits have a forming or shaping effect on us. In fact, someone has once said that you make your habits and then your habits make you. Do you agree with that? Like 40% of our behavior, according to Duke University study, is habitual and habits have a forming effect on us. So like right now, wherever you're at financially, like if you're financially fit or financially unfit, it's probably because of your habits. 
If you're in shape right now, physically, it's probably because of your habits. If you're not in shape, it's probably because of your habits. If you have a great marriage right now, you're you know, best friends with your spouse, or you have a great dating relationship, and it's really going well, it's probably because of your habits. If it's not going well, it's probably because of your relational habits. Do you agree with this? Like, this is how it, so what's true in our physical life or our financial life is also true in the spiritual life. If, like, if you're like rolling with God and you feel his presence and you're praying and you're, you know, you're spending time with him and you feel joy and peace and like, you're, it's probably because you have good spiritual habits. Habits form and they shape our life. What we said last week is that a spiritually mature person is someone who has learned to be controlled by the Holy Spirit instead of their sinful nature. We have the Spirit of God, if you're a believer today, has come to live inside of you. We also have the sinful nature that does not go away. Anybody familiar with your sinful nature? Yeah, it's that selfish part of you, that prideful part of you, that part of you that wants to continue to sin even though you know it's not right. Amen? Anybody else? But a spiritual mature person has learned to be led by the Spirit instead of being controlled by the flesh. Therefore, they're able to consistently demonstrate the character of Jesus, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that come out of them naturally. How did they do that? How do you get there? And last week, what we said is that a Spirit-led person, or becoming Spirit-led, we become Spirit-led through, there it is, through habit. And so last week I introduced you to the first habit of of a spiritually mature person, and that is engaging the scripture. And I challenged you to go home and do some homework and memorize one verse per week. And I know everybody did their homework, right? Everybody did their homework. Six verses of Psalm 23, and then I told you we were going to recite it together. So because everyone did their homework, this is going to be a a group group event here, right? Yes? All of our campuses? So let's, let's do that together. We'll just start in Psalm 23, verse 1, and we'll go to 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Nice job, guys. That's pretty good. I, I'm actually pretty impressed. I don't know what happened at the other campuses, but here at Stones Crossing, you know, that, 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 there's a lot of you there with me, and then some of you just, you, just, you just didn't participate at all. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Maybe you weren't here last week, first time, uh, but, but, but what we said last week is that a spiritually matured person has engaged the scriptures because the scriptures have a transforming effect on, on our heart and on our soul. So if you missed last week, go back and check that out. Great job on your homework. I've got some more homework for you today when it comes to prayer because that's what we're talking about today, so be prepared for that. Habit number two of a spiritually mature person is the habit of, you know, you guessed it, of prayer, of prayer. Some of you know that I'm a huge fan of Dallas Willard. One of his fantastic books is called Spirit of the Disciplines. Renovation of the Heart is another one. Uh, Divine Conspiracy is, is, is fantastic as well. This one, he talks about the spiritual practices or habits of a, of a spiritually mature person. And he defines prayer like this. He says that prayer is conversing, communicating with God. When we pray, we talk to God aloud or within our thoughts. We talk to God aloud or within, within, in, within our thoughts. Prayer is, is communicating with God. It's conversing with God. It is not talking to the universe, okay? There's a big group movement out there like, that talks about the universe as if the universe had a, a, a mind or a, a will or, or, or desires. No, no, no. This is talking to God. It's not talking to creation. It's not talking to trees. It's, some people even say this to me. Yeah, I pray. I talk to myself. It's like, no, you're not God. That's not prayer. That's an inner, an inner dialogue that you're having with yourself, okay? Prayer is talking, it's communicating to God out loud or within, within in, your, in your thoughts. Jesus told us that we should pray. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, instead of praying like the hypocrites who pray out loud so that they can be seen and heard, here's what I want you to do. Matthew chapter six, when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you. And what does it say? Pray to your father 
in private. Another version says, do it in secret. Then your father who sees everything, that's an interesting statement. The father sees everything always. And he sees you when you get in your little prayer closet or prayer room and you shut the door. He's watching. He will reward you. Jesus taught that we should all have a private place, a secret place where we go, we close out the world, and we spend time praying. My, my spot at my house is my back porch. I was there again this morning at 5, 540, 545, even though it was 36 degrees outside. I was out there, I have a little heater, <laughs> and I get out there and I spend time, I close the door, my dog is with me, okay, one of my dogs was with me, uh, but, but, it, but mostly I was with the Father and I was, I was praying, I do that every single morning of my life. It is a habit that I have. Jesus did this, he modeled this. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament is Mark chapter one, listen to, what, listen to how Jesus lived his life. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark outside, okay, before the sun was up, Jesus got up, those of you who are morning people, you kinda, you're going to have to, you're gonna have to maybe make some changes. Okay, you're not morning people. <laughs> you're going to have to, this is what Jesus did. He got up and he left the house. And what did he do? He went off to a solitary place. And what did he do there? He prayed. This was the, this was the natural flow of Jesus' life. I read that as a young Christian many years ago. I said, well, if he's going to do it, then I'm going to do it, right? What's good for him is probably good for me. Like, he didn't even have a sinful nature to deal with. I do. I'm bent towards selfishness. I'm bent towards pride. I'm bent towards sinful things. All the more, I need to get up early in the morning before the sun, find a quiet, solitary place, and I need to pray. In Luke, Luke chapter 5, this is what Luke said. Uh, Jesus, Jesus would often withdraw to lonely places to pray. This was the pattern of his life. Fast forward to, the, to Paul's time when he was writing his letters. His famous verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it simply says this, never stop praying. Like prayer is supposed to be a habit. Do you agree with this? Prayer is supposed to be something that we do. Another version says pray without ceasing. But here's my question. Nobody's gonna argue with the fact that this book, the Bible tells us to pray, to pray continually, to pray consistently, to find a private place, a lonely place, and pray. No one's gonna say, nah, it doesn't say that. No, it says it all over the place. We know we should pray, right? My question is, how does prayer help us to become spiritually mature. How does prayer help us to become the type of person who's controlled by the spirit and not the flesh? That's the question I wanna answer today because if we can answer that question, that's the why. If you get the why behind prayer, like why should I pray? Like I know I should, but why? I have that answer in my heart. I know that prayer makes me a spiritual person. Am I perfect? Oh no, not at all, not even close, but it's helping you to become more and more and more like Jesus as I get older. How does prayer do that? Three ways, you taking notes, you got your pen? All right, grab it real quick. If you got your app, take it out. How does it do that? Number one, prayer reorients your mind towards God. I don't know about you, but my mind, <laughs> naturally, because I still have a sinful nature, is oriented or tends to be oriented around everything that I physically see, physical things, right? Whether that is a nice shiny car uh, or whether that is a nice uh, steak <laughs> dinner uh, or a, a new pair of shoes. I'm a shoe guy. Any shoe guys out there? I'm like, oh, man, man, look at those shoes. I was, I was at a party yesterday for, with, with a friend, a uh, little, uh, little baby shower. I didn't know dudes do baby showers, too, but they, evidently they do. Um, first one I've ever been to. But there's a guy at this baby shower, this dude baby shower, um, <laughs> And, and I was like looking at his shoes like, man. So after the little diaper did, you know, party was over, I walked up to him, I said, man, where'd you get those shoes? We gotta talk. Well, I, I, my, I'm oriented naturally towards things, physical things, look, things on earth. And, and that's what, if I'm not careful, my whole life will be consumed with what I can see, taste, smell, and experience. Prayer simply reorients us towards God. It reorients our mind. Jesus taught his disciples. They said, hey, can you teach us to pray? Okay, here's, 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 here's how it works. First things first. Here's how I want you to pray. Our Father in heaven. First thing Jesus says to his disciples. 
Look up. Our Father who is in heaven, you're reorienting your focus, your mind, on God. And then he says, hallowed be your name. Now, many of you probably grew up saying that, but you have no idea what it means. Hallowed be your name. What does that even mean? You know what it means? It means to make God's name holy. Now, when the Bible talks about a name, it's not talking about Jehovah, God's name. It's talking about his character, what he's like. So really what Jesus is saying is, I want you to lift up your eyes and I want you to focus on using your life to make God's character, his heart, his mind, the central focus of your life. Reorient your mind around God. The Apostle Paul would say later on in Colossians chapter 3, set your minds on things above, not on things on earth. Now, Things like shoes and cars and these things, these things are necessary, but they're not supposed to consume us. They're not supposed to be the focus of our life, money and possessions and houses and pleasure and vacations. They're all fine, but they're not supposed to be the treasure of our heart. Prayer says, God, you are the center. My mind is upon you. And the goal of my life is to hollow your name and to make it holy and to live in such a way to honor your character. That's what prayer does. And as we do that more and more and more, as it becomes a habit of our life, you become the type of person that lives for God. You become like God. Henry Nouwen is a famous author, writer, spiritual writer. He's written many, many books. This one is on prayer, the only necessary thing, living a prayerful life. Listen to what Henry Nouwen said. I love this. He said, when you have a habit of praying, praying pervades every aspect of our lives. Did you know that prayer is supposed to do that? It is the unceasing recognition that God is wherever we are. In other words, it it puts God at the center of your, wherever you are in a grocery store, at home, whether you're you're at at the gym or at work, or God is at the center, why? Because you're praying. Your attention is always, my father, my father, my mind is on you. Always inviting us to come closer and closer to celebrate the divine gift of of being alive. He goes on to say later on in the book, he says that when, when prayer, when we give it serious attention and develop, watch this, an appropriate discipline, should I say habit? It's another word. The appropriate habit, we will see a real transformation in our lives and it will lead us closer and closer to God. See, prayer changes us because it it, it reorients our mind around God. Prayer puts God at the center of our lives. This is making sense, yes or no? And when Christ is at the center of your life, man, you, you just, everything changes. You see everything differently. Secondly, how does prayer turn us into a person who is controlled by the spirit rather than the sinful nature? Number two, prayer aligns your desires and will with God. See, the problem with the sinful nature is it wants to do things that are contrary to God. The apostle Paul said the flesh or the sinful nature has desires that are contrary to the Holy Spirit. And these two, these two forces are constantly fighting each other. You know what prayer does? Prayer simply aligns your desires and your heart with God. See, it's, it's good to reorient our minds towards God. It really is. Get our, get, get our thoughts to set our mind on things above, our Father in heaven. But it, the, the prayer must go deeper than the mind. It, prayer must get to the level of desire. It must get to the level of what I want. One time Jesus said this, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and all these things will be added unto you. What Jesus was saying is that he's trying to put his finger on what are you seeking? What do you want? And so when we pray appropriately, what we're praying is, is to say, God, I, I, I'm surrendering. Not, I'm not just reorienting my mind around you. I'm also taking my will and all of my desires, and I'm surrendering them to yours. Listen to what Jesus says next in the prayer. He says, here, here's how to pray. Our Father out in heaven, hallowed be your name. Watch this, next phrase. Your kingdom come. How interesting. This is the model prayer. You know, a kingdom implies a king or a queen. And it's not you. 
Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the reality that you're not the main character in this story? You're like in a movie and you're support staff. You're a background actor. You're a supporting actor. And Jesus is the king and he's the main character. And our job is to support and collaborate to tell the story around the main character, the king. So when we pray, we're taking our will, we're taking our desires, and we're saying, your kingdom come. Now, a king has a will. A king has desires. A king has a plan. And our job is to figure out what he wants, what he desires, and what his plan is, and then to kind of cooperate with him to achieve that. But, but most of us, we're, we're acting like we're little kings and queens. What am I going to do today? God, will you bless my plans? When we pray, it's like, hey, God, I got this and this and this. Will you just kind of, like, help me? Have you, are you anybody guilty? I am. Like, I got a lot of things to do today. Would you help me do this? All this stuff I got to do. I'm so busy. And we pray. And we ask God to bless our will and our desires and our plans. Jesus says, here's how it works. Here's how it works. Ready? You, you focus your mind on God, our Father in heaven, and then you surrender your will. Your kingdom come. Watch what Jesus says. Your will be done. Not my will. I'm not the king. You're not the king. You're not the queen. We're not praying for God to achieve or help us with our will. And I mean, I really want this job and I really want this to happen. I want this to happen for my son or my daughter. I want this to happen. Hmm. You ever pray that way? It's not proper prayer. The proper prayer is to say, God, I surrender at the level of my soul, desires, will, appetites to your will to be done. Where? On earth. What does that mean? Does that mean over in Africa somewhere? How about Europe? <laughs> I pray that your will be done over there in Iran. You know, all those crazy places, terrible things are happening in the world. Oh God, I pray for your will to be done. No, you know what it means? It means God, right here in my life, today, may your will be done on earth in me as it is done in heaven. Jesus prayed this pray this way. When he was on the cross, getting ready to go to the cross, to die a horrible death, to sacrifice his life for our sins so we can have eternal life and abundant life. You know what he prayed? Some of you know what he prayed. Listen, Luke 22. Father, if you're willing, take this cup of the cross from me. If there's another way to redeem mankind, if there's another way to provide forgiveness of sins, please, now would be a great time to execute that plan. Nevertheless, yet not my will, but yours be done. That's how we pray. And, Jesus, and the Father says to Jesus, there's no other way. The only way to redeem mankind is to have you die for their sins. And Jesus surrendered to that will and died on the cross for you and I. So prayer helps us to become like Christ because it reorients our mind toward God. It also aligns our will and our desires with the Father. And then number three, prayer cultivates peace. Maybe the most important part. Prayer. How does prayer help us to become Christ-like? How does it help us to become spiritually more mature people so that we're able to demonstrate the character of Jesus consistently? It cultivates peace. What is peace? Well, it's hard to define peace. Think of it as the opposite of anxiety. Think of it as the opposite of worry. When you're anxious and worried, it's just, you know, you don't, you don't feel good. You have to maybe have some tightness in the chest. You know, your blood pressure is up. You can't sleep. You know, maybe you overeat you just because you're worried, you're anxious. You know, it's just, ah. Think about peace as the opposite of that. I like the word chill. Does that word resonate with anybody? One time, Dallas Willard was given a talk, and at the end of the talk, somebody asked him, if you had one word to describe Jesus, what would it be? And Dallas responded without hesitating. He said, relaxed. Jesus was relaxed, wasn't anxious, 
we got to go to the next town because there's someone there I need to talk to. Let's go. You guys are taking too long. But Jesus, you know, we got to, no, he wasn't stressed. He was relaxed. One time before he went to heaven, he said this to his disciples in John 14. I'm leaving you with a gift. Yes, eternal life. Yes, forgiveness of sins. I'm also leaving you with another gift. Peace of mind and heart. And this peace that I give you is a peace the world cannot give. So don't freak out. Stop. You know what that means? Stop freaking out. Yeah? Yeah? It's my translation, but that's what it says. Don't be troubled or afraid. You're always freaking out. You're always worried. I'm giving you peace. Like, Jesus gave us the gift. We have the gift. The problem is we have not learned how to cultivate the gift. And the way that you do that is by praying. You want to know why prayer cultivates peace? Is because prayer is really an exercise of trust. That's what it is. Prayer is an exercise of trust. When you pray, you're saying, God, I'm taking this situation with my spouse, son, daughter, work, with the diagnosis from the doctor. I, uh, I'm taking this situation with my boss and this, this financial situation that we can't pay for. I am taking this situation and I'm going to put it in your hands. And I'm going to allow you to control the situation. See, see here's the problem with, with most of us. You are a control freak. And when you try to control, have you noticed this? When you try to control your life, it produces nothing but anxiety and anger. Have you noticed that yet? Come on, some of us have, we should be aware of this by now because we've lived long enough. You've been trying to control scenarios for, for over two decades now, and all you've gotten is anger and frustration and anxiety. Stop it, right? Like we're old enough now, it's like, but that doesn't work. Is there another way? Yes, the, the other way is to take the scenario and the situation and to put it in the hands of God. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter five. Cast all your, all your what? Your what? See, the, does the Bible talk about anxiety? You bet it does. Jesus talked about it. Peter talked about it. I want you to grab a hold of your anxiety or the thing that is causing anxiety, the fact that you're still single, the fact that you don't have a baby yet, the fact that you're, you don't have the job that you love, the fact that whatever. Take that scenario and I want you to cast it, which that word means to throw away. I want you to grab a hold of it. I want you to throw it on God. Why? Because he cares for you and he can handle it. You know, when I pray, I, I, I'm so thankful that that. I have an understanding of who I'm praying to. I'm not praying to the universe. I'm not praying to the trees, the leaves, the birds. I'm not praying to the animals. I'm praying to the God who parts oceans. I don't know about you, but I just know that. Like when I pray, I'm praying to a God, the God who parted the Red Sea for the, for the Israelites to walk across. I'm praying to the God who shut the mouths of the lions so they, they wouldn't eat Daniel. That's the God I'm praying to. How about you? I don't know. I, who do you pray to? I don't know. Well, when I pray, I'm praying to a God who spoke and created the heavens and the earth. That's the one I'm praying to. Like with one word, he created matter and the stars. The other day we got to watch the eclipse. How many of you saw that? How many of you witnessed that? That like God spoke that into existence. Isn't it amazing how the moon and the sun can appear the same size in the sky and overlap and cancel each other out when... They're so vastly different in size and distance from the earth. Who, who but God could do something like that? That's the God I pray to. Like he's the God who walked on water. I, I don't know, have you heard? He's the God who turned water into wine. He's the God who, we just talked about this in our miracle series, he raised a little boy from the dead. Like I, that's the God I pray to. Like when I pray, I'm like, you can do anything. You are the most competent, most intelligent, most powerful being, self-existent, glorious, wonderful, and watch this, all loving. That's the one I pray to. Like he cares about me. A lot of people think that God created the world and, and he spun it into existence and then he's kind of disinterested. It's over there somewhere, those idiots down there. Those dummies killing each other with nuclear bombs and genocide is stupid people. Some, people. some people really believe that that's God's attitude towards them. He is distant, disengaged, and he doesn't care. 
good luck with your prayer life. I mean, can you even pray to a God like that? But I pray to a God who, who actually is powerful and competent and intelligent, but he's also loving. And so therefore, Paul can say with confidence something like this in Philippians chapter four. Do not be anxious about anything. Whatever comes into your life, whether it's a parenting issue, a financial issue, a job issue, a health issue, do not be anxious. Do not try to control the situation by worrying about it. Some, isn't that funny how we do that sometimes? We think that's a, it's the responsible thing to worry. Well, what else am I supposed to do? How about pray? Do not be anxious about anything, but rather in every situation by prayer and petition, which that's another word for prayer, to make a petition to God. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Cast that on the shoulders of God and watch what happens next. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, when you pray, you're trusting in God. You're putting the outcome of the situation in his hands and you're letting go. Well, that creates space for the peace to come in. See, as long as, in your, as long as you're in control and you're acting like God, you cannot trust God. You have to release that. Put, this, put the situation in his hands and now his peace can flood your heart because you're putting your faith in him to control the outcome. This is life-changing stuff. So every day, every single day, I don't care if I'm on a mission trip in some other country. I don't care if I've been up late the night before dealing with an issue. It doesn't matter if it's Sunday morning and I have to preach. Every single day I wake up and I go to my spot on the back porch and I pray. And sometimes the prayers are incoherent because it's tough in the morning. It's, you know, I haven't even had a cup of coffee. And sometimes I'm, uh, you know, saying things that, that maybe don't even make sense. But I'm praying because I'm putting outcomes in God's hands. I'm aligning my heart and mind with him. And I'm reorienting my, my focus on him. Here's a little acronym that I use every single morning. It's called SOAP. The S stands for scripture. We talked about that last week. I'll get my Bible and I'll start to read a passage. I use the one-year Bible. It gives me the date. You can go to the app, the, the uh, 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 YouVersion app. You can follow the plan that I follow. This morning it was in Joshua 24, Psalm 89, Proverbs 13. I read the scripture. As I'm reading the scripture, I'm asking God to show me just one verse. This morning it was uh, in Joshua 24, uh, Joshua said to the children of Israel, choose this day who you will serve. God spoke to my heart. He says, you still choosing me? I was like, yeah. Today I choose you. The new observation is who, who is he talking to? What's the principle? What's the truth here? What am I, what am I supposed to, what's the, what's the theological idea? What is God saying? The application is what am I going to do about it? How does this apply to my life? And then the P is just praying that through. It's taking those ideas that you just heard from God. See, the habits overlap. And, and I'm, we're going to say this in the series. Like last week we talked about scripture, but prayer overlaps with scripture. Because now you're praying about the scripture you just read. And then you're also praying about whatever else is on your mind. Whatever else is about to come to your day, into your day. Whatever you have to face. God brings someone to mind that has cancer, you pray about that. God brings someone to mind who's struggling with an addiction, you pray about that. Whatever in that moment, this time right here, you start to pray about that. That's my pattern. I've been doing that for probably two decades. I've filled journal after journal after journal with prayers. So guess what? I'm becoming the type of person who is more controlled by the Holy Spirit than the sinful nature. I no longer yell at people in roundabouts. <laughs> now I just, 
Now I just pray for those jerks. I just, <laughs> bunch of idiots, you know. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. But I'm much, much better. Well, guess what? There are so many other areas in my life that are getting better. Why? Because I'm, 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 I'm aligning my mind with God. I'm getting, I'm getting in alignment with him. I'm focusing on God. And I've cultivated peace. I would hope, I would hope that as I get older, and my staff would be the ones to tell you, and my wife would be the ones to tell you, that if someone said, hey, could you give me one word that described Pastor Danny? Danny, I would hope, as time goes by, they would say relaxed. Not productive and busy. Not energetic and passionate. Just relaxed because I've learned to put outcomes in the hands of God. How about you? Wouldn't that be fun to live that way? To be chill? Just totally be chill. How about we just practice for the next couple of minutes? Seriously, like all of our campuses, microsites, online. Why don't we just take two minutes and just pray? Just get, let's just do it right now. Like right now, just our Father, reorient your mind, align your heart and your will, and cultivate that peace. Take a few minutes to do that right now. was built on you I say
I was praying for you just now asking God's peace to flood your heart that you would sense his presence. Some of you here today, the next couple of moments are, are designed for you. A few moments ago, I mentioned that Christ prayed this prayer. He said, Father, let this cup pass by me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. The cup Jesus spoke of was his crucifixion. The Father sent the Son to die on the cross because he loved you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He spread out his arms, had nails put through his hands and feet, and he was crucified. He had to be because the penalty of sin is death. And it was either going to be you or it was going to be him. And because God loves you so much, he chose to punish his son on your behalf so that you could go free, so that you could be forgiven. It's the most amazing love story ever told. That God gave his son for you. Jesus put it like this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe today you step into that grace, that love, and you ask Christ to be your savior. You just acknowledge that you've, you're a sinner and you've broken God's laws, but you realize that Christ died in your place, paid the price for your sin so that you could be forgiven. If that's where you're at today, I'm gonna say a simple prayer. Take these words, make them your own and put your faith in Christ today. Will you pray with me? Just say this to him, dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Taking on the penalty I should have paid and canceling the debt that I owed. I receive your love today. I I reach out in faith and I receive your grace. Wash my sin away. Cleanse my soul. I repent of my sin and I turn to you for forgiveness. In this moment, fill me with your peace. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, give me the courage and the fortitude to follow you and to honor your name with my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we would love to celebrate with you. Amen. So exciting. If you did just trust in Christ, we would love to put a saved box in your hands. Inside this box, there is a Bible uh, with some information to get you started on your journey with Christ about the church, small group, baptism, and all that stuff. Uh, But most importantly, there is a Bible in here for you, a New Testament, because as you engage in the scriptures, that's the thing that's gonna help you change the most. So text the word SAVE to 65248. You can grab one of these at the information desk. If you're watching online, give us a little bit more info. We'll send one to you in the mail. One more time, church, can we give God glory, amen? Right now, I'm going to hand things off to the local teams. God bless you guys. See you next week. Bring a friend. Well, thank you, Pastor Danny. Man, what an incredible message. What an incredible challenge for us. And speaking of challenges, I hope that you take that challenge this week and you set aside 10 minutes to pray and just watch and just listen and see what God does in your life. Just setting aside that time to pray. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, congratulations to you. Uh, Text SAVE 65248. Love to send you your SAVE box in the mail. I'll, I'll follow up with you this week. Love to help you on your new spiritual journey. Well, we're continuing this series next week. Can't wait to see you. Uh, Make sure you tell a friend and be a friend and bring a friend. So you guys have an awesome week. See you later. Hi, families. Welcome to our online campus kids ministry. We're so glad you're here. If this is your first time tuning in, go ahead and text hello to 65248 so we can say hi and welcome you. We have an awesome time planned for you today. Now, if you're a fifth or sixth grader, you can find your content on our website at eclife.org slash kidswatch. Parents, if you want to rewatch today's content and get some great follow-up activities for home, you can also head to eclife.org slash kidswatch. 
let's kick things off with our preschool friends and Ollie. This month, we're talking about how we can do what Jesus says. Today, we're going to hear a true story from the Bible about how we can love like Jesus. I'm so excited to hear it, but first, let's worship together. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, hi friends, I'm Jayla. Do you wanna see what I have with me today? I have a flashlight, a glow worm, light of shoes, and a glow stick. Do you know what's the same about all these things? They all shine light. Like when I press this button on the flashlight, it shines. When I squeeze the glow worm's tummy, it shines. When I bend this glow stick, it shines. When I run and dance in these shoes, they shine. I love how they all shine. It's Ollie! Hello, Jayla. Who? Who? Shining many things, are you? Yes, Ollie. I'm making all these things shine. Lights can shine in many ways. It's true. I have a story of shining bright for you. Listen up. Just follow me through. Who? Who? Follow me through.
Ah, hola, friends! I'm Luis the Handyman, and I just fixed this light for my neighbor. Let's see if it lights up now. Woohoo! Oh, there we go. Now that heart shines. It's a shining heart of love. Say, that reminds me of today's story. <laughs> Do you want to help me build it? <laughs> Great! Hammers up, little builders. Ready? Uno, dos, tres, hammer! Great job, little helpers. You can put your hammers down. Now we just need our story tools. Yep, we have everything we need. Today's true story from the Bible begins with Jesus' friends. One day, Jesus told his friends to love people the way Jesus loves them. So, do you know what they did? They loved like Jesus. Do you know how they loved like Jesus? Well, if someone needed a coat, they gave them a coat. They were loving like Jesus and shining their light. Let's see what else they did. If someone needed a place to stay, they shared their home. Wow, <laughs> they were loving like Jesus and shining their light. Let's see what else they did. If someone didn't have something to eat, they would give them something to eat. They were loving like Jesus and shining their light. When we love like Jesus, we are shining our light too. <laughs> Jesus' friends also ate and talk and pray together. They loved each other because Jesus loved them. They were loving like Jesus and shining their light. And do you know what else Jesus' friends did? They sang and praised God. This showed everyone that they were friends with Jesus. When they praised God, they were shining their light. <laughs> you can love like Jesus and shine your light too. Hold up your light. Now say, I can love like Jesus. Ready? I can love like Jesus. Oh, let's say it louder. I can love like Jesus. Oh, one more time. I can love like Jesus. <laughs> Great job, friends. We can all do what Jesus says and love like Jesus. Hey there, Ollie. Tell me, who can do what Jesus says? I can do what Jesus says. Yes, it's true. Now let's hear it from you. Tell me, who can do what Jesus says? I can do what Jesus says. That's the truth, friends. See you next time. Adios. So there's your story, and it's all true. Jesus says we can be a light. That means me and you, too. Thanks, Ollie. Goodbye to you. Ho, ho. Wow, we can do what Jesus says and love like Jesus. I think I got the story. Did you get it? If you did, say got it. Get it? Got it! Good. I know when I love like Jesus, I can shine wherever I go. See you next time. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. The people sang and praised God forever. This showed everyone that they were friends with Jesus. When they praised God, they were shining their light. We can do what Jesus says and love like Jesus. Preschool friends, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next week and bring a friend. Now it's time for our elementary friends. This month we're talking about patience. We can live with patience, which is waiting until later for what you want now. I bet we can all think of things we really want, things we wish could happen right now, but we often have to wait for those things to happen. Patience can be difficult for all of us, and we really need God's help in order to wait patiently. We're gonna learn more today, but first let's worship together.
Your plans, your dreams are so much greater. Your timing, you keep, it's always better. So when I'm feeling weak, your strength is always perfect. So I'm holding on, cause I know it will be worth it. So I'm waiting. Frisbee, sparklers, Skyler! I've been looking for you everywhere. I'm drooling over this cupcake. Oh, really? <laughs> it's a dog toy for the puppy my cousin's bringing to the cookout later. Oh. Don't worry, we'll have real cupcakes at the real cookout. Now I gotta wait. Hello, welcome to Story Lab. This week, we're talking about patience, while we take a look at the story of some people who had a little trouble waiting. Why me? Hi, I'm Skylar. And I'm Sebastian. Today, we're talking about patience, which is waiting until later for what you want now. I want a cupcake now. I'm still amazed this one's fake. It may be a fake cupcake, but it's a real dog toy. Hey, let's play real or fake. Great idea. Let's do it. Welcome to Real or Fake, the game show where you have to look at a photo and decide whether it's real or fake. Love this game. It'll be easy, right? Here is your first clue. Uh, hmm. Is that a mop? Hmm. I might need one of those to clean up after the cookout. Wait, that's that's not a mop. I th I think it's a dog. Dog? Yeah. Dog? Dog. Dog. And correct! Yes! It is not a mop, but it is a dog. Yes. Next image. Is it real or is it fake? That's a lot of gold. It looks really real. But wait, I bet they're chocolate. Chocolate? Chocolate. Chocolate. That is correct. Yes. These are chocolate coins. Next image. Oh, yum. Ooh. Looks like ice cream. That That's ice cream. We're going to go with ice cream? Yeah. Ice, ice cream. cream. And no. <laughs> Unfortunately, that answer is incorrect. This image is actually mashed potatoes. They mm -hmm. have been dyed with food coloring. 
You see, advertisers often use mashed potatoes instead of ice cream because it does not melt under the lights. Tricky, tricky. It pays to have a keen eye. Next image. More food. Okay. Sebastian, stand up. Listen, friend, I know it's difficult. I know you're being challenged, but you have to wait for the cookout later. Remember this, you will be okay. You're right, I'm okay. I can play this game, we got this. Okay, what are we thinking? What? I think it's a cheeseburger. I mean, if you look at the patty, yeah. the pickles, even the sesame seeds, real. But wait, what if it's a vegetable burger with a vegetable meat? Ooh, good point. Uh, I don't trust my eyes anymore, uh, you pick. Ooh. But it looks really juicy. Okay. I think it's real cheeseburger. Yeah. Real cheeseburger? Real cheeseburger. Real, real cheeseburger. cheeseburger. Unfortunately, that answer is incorrect. This delicious looking item is not a cheeseburger. It's cake. What? what? It's, it's cake? cake? I did not see that coming. I need it either way. For sure. I'd have a hard time waiting for that one. Speaking of waiting, it's time for the story before the story. Today, we're in Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament. After God chose Abraham and promised to bless the whole world through his family, the Israelites grew in numbers. But then the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. At last, God sent Moses to lead the people to freedom. Moses led God's people into the wilderness, where God provided food and water, which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Erica. The Israelites had been living under Egyptian rule for hundreds of years. Now free, in the wilderness, they had to learn what it meant to be God's people. When the Israelites camped near Mount Sinai, God's presence descended on the mountain in fire and cloud. God called out to Moses. You have seen for yourselves what I did to Egypt. You saw how I carried you on the wings of eagles and brought you to myself. Now obey me completely. Keep my covenant. You will be my holy nation. When Moses told the people, they were all in. We'll do everything, we'll do everything, everything the Lord has told us to do. God wanted to give Moses a special set of rules that would help them stay connected to God and keep them safe. So God called Moses to come to the mountaintop. Wait for us here until we come back to you. Anyone who has a problem can go to my brother Aaron. Then Moses and his helper, Joshua, went up to the mountain. While Joshua waited, Moses went right into that cloud to speak with God. They were up there for 40 days and nights, which is a really, really long time. As you can imagine, the Israelites started to get impatient. They surrounded Aaron and demanded answers. Where is Moses? What's happened to him? Oh, uh, please. Be patient. Moses will return. Yeah, you keep saying that. We need someone to lead us for reals. Like right now. You should make us a god. The Israelites were so impatient that they forgot all the ways that God had already provided for them. They forgot that they had promised to obey. Even Aaron panicked. Okay, okay, uh, here's what we'll do. Uh... Uh, bring me all your gold earrings. The people brought all their gold earrings and Aaron melted them together and formed a statue of a calf, a golden calf. The Israelites went all in right away. Hey, this is the God who brought us up out of Egypt. Uh, what? In their fear and impatience, Aaron and the people actually chose to worship their own golden jewelry. <laughs> Let's feast. Let's make sacrifices, eat and drink and dance before this golden calf. So that is what they did. They sacrificed burnt offerings, ate festive food and danced wildly in front of the statue. But in the meantime, on the mountain, God spoke to Moses. 
go down. Your people you brought up out of Egypt have become very sinful. They have quickly turned away from what I commanded them. Please have mercy on your people. Moses, carrying two stone tablets with God's laws, started back down the mountain. Joshua hurried along beside him. When they got close to camp, they heard a loud noise. It sounds like war in the camp. That's not the sound of battle. That's the sound of singing. As they got closer, Moses and Joshua saw the people dancing in front of the golden calf. Moses was so angry that he threw the tablets on the ground and they broke. What did these people do to you? How did they make you lead them into such terrible sin? Please don't be angry. You know how they like to complain. They, they said to me, make us a god to worship. So I asked them for their gold, threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Um, right. That calf just popped out of the fire on its own? Moses knew the truth. He was so angry that people had forgotten all God had done that he took the golden calf and burned it in the fire. Then he scattered the ashes in the Israelites' drinking water. It was a bitter reminder of what they had done. The Israelites' impatience led to some terrible things. But even when the people turned away over and over, God remained faithful and continued to provide for them on their journey in the wilderness. The end. Wow, the Israelites really crashed and burned on this one. Yeah, but when you're stressed out, it's really easy to forget all the good stuff God has done. True story. So, what's, what's our, our part, part in the story? story? When you have to wait, take time to focus on what's true. Think of the ways that God has helped you before. You can remember that God loves you deeply, no matter what. You can remember that God is always with you while you wait. Exactly, that's true. And God has also put people in your life to help you while you wait. You know, waiting can actually sometimes make things better. Like cupcakes. If you take them out of the oven too early, you're not gonna get cupcakes. You're gonna get a gooey mess. Waiting well is hard. But remember that you don't have to do it on your own. When we follow Jesus, God sends the Holy Spirit to live with us. And patience is actually a gift from God's Spirit. It is a gift you can ask for. Like every day. Sounds like you both have got it. See you next time. Bye. Bye. So here's the thing. When you have to wait, remember what's true. I waited a long time for this cookout. <laughs> Cupcake? I can wait. There are very real cupcakes at the cookout. Come on. Wait. Thanks for joining us in the story lab. See, See you, you next, next time. time. Wait for me. Even though God had rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, the people forgot so quickly. They forgot to trust that God was with them and that God would lead them. They tried to do things on their own and find something else to worship. When we find ourselves in situations where we have to wait for something we really want, or if there's something that we hope will happen and we're not sure that it ever will, we need to take time to think about what's true. That's what we need to focus on today. I want you to remember this. When you have to wait, remember what's true. We can remember that God loves us no matter what and that God is always with us while we wait. We can remember that God can help us to be patient. We can remember that God has put people in our lives who can encourage us and help us wait well. I've had an amazing day with you. We'll see you next week and bring a friend.